Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new episode of the Word of the Day podcast, coming to you as always, pre-recorded from the RAV4 studios. My name is Jamie Silva. It is my pleasure to host this show. And before we get to today's word, I'd like to quickly address something from our last episode, a fact check of sorts. The word was impracticable, which means like extremely or prohibitively impractical, probably to the point of being infeasible or undoable. One of the examples we used of something impracticable was growing a thousand bushels of tomatoes on just, and I quote, a couple acres of land. How could you cram enough tomato plants into that tiny space, we asked. It's impracticable. Well, as it turns out, a well-cared-for tomato field, in the right climate and all that, can produce about 1,500 cartons of tomatoes per acre, with cartons being, I guess, a common measure of vegetable quantities in the business. Each of those cartons is 25 pounds, so we're talking 37,500 pounds of tomatoes, and a bushel of tomatoes is about 50 pounds. So, we pulled out the official word of the day abacus and had producer Pete crunch the numbers, and this translates into approximately 750 bushels of tomatoes, all of that from just one acre. So, the upshot is, a thousand bushels is not all that big of a stretch on, again I quote, a couple acres. Now, we did stipulate that the field they were growing in didn't get very much sun, which probably would have stunted production a good deal. That said, I don't know, like, maybe this wasn't quite so outlandish a tomato target as we thought, rendering the venture not quite so impracticable as we made it out to be. Never underestimate the efficiency of modern agriculture, I guess is the lesson here. Another lesson might be to break out the abacus before recording the show, but that's neither here nor there. Now, without further ado, let's move on to today's word, which is the adjective eponymous. This simply means having the same name as or being named for someone. And just super quickly here, the etymology of eponymous. Uh, It comes from the Greek words epi, meaning upon, and onoma, meaning name. Put them together and you get the Greek term eponymos, which obviously sounds super similar to the English version and just means named after or given as a name to something. By way of example, if this show were called The Jamie Silva Show, then you could refer to it as My Eponymous Show. Shortening it to The Jamie Show would also count as eponymous, as well as a little self-centered, I think. But I don't think you can go the opposite direction and, like, add on more information or descriptors to the title. Like, if it were Words with Jamie, or Silva Synonyms, or the Jamie Explains Random Words You May Have Heard Of But Probably Forgot show, none of these would qualify, because they add extra non-name information. Let's turn to the online definition of eponymous, which goes like this, quote, Of a person giving their name to something, or of a thing named after a particular person, unquote. So Conan, as you may know, is a late-night talk show on the channel TBS, featuring the eponymous host, Conan O'Brien. By the same token, Conan O'Brien, the man, hosts an eponymous show called Conan. Now, there is a noun form of eponymous as well, eponym, which, and this should sound familiar, can refer to either the thing that's named for someone or the someone that thing is named for. Again, a little circular, a little weird, but I wouldn't get hung up on it, because the point is, no matter which way you use eponymous or eponym, odds are it's still correct. There are two reasons why eponymous is a great word to know and use. First, it often saves time and avoids confusion and weird sentence structures. Like, if I said, among all the Beatles albums, I like the Beatles album the best. Hearing that, you'd probably reply, yes, but which Beatles album? And I'd be like, the Beatles. And you'd be like, what about the Beatles? And we'd go back and forth, like it's a who's on first routine. I mean, I guess I I could spell it out all at once by saying, like, I especially appreciate the album The Beatles released in 1968, the name of which was The Beatles, just like the band itself, though it was also known as The White Album. Instead of all that, think how much easier it is to say, I've always been a big fan of The Beatles' eponymous album, released in 1968. And since, obviously, tons of artists put out eponymous albums, you really ought to refer to them as such. The second reason you should use eponymous is that it's kind of a fun rhetorical flourish. It's neat, it's tidy, it's cool, and it's a little different because you don't hear it all that often. But it isn't pretentious, I don't think, because you're not using a fancy word where just a simple one would do. Rather, there is no simple word, or any word at all in the English language, that does what eponymous can. Like, if you go to thesaurus.com and search for eponymous, you'll only get four results. Eponymic, titular, nominative, and onymous. Once again, that is onymous, not ominous. Uh, And none of these are really synonyms with eponymous. They're related, but definitely not substitutes. And they're mostly very narrow use and obscure, too. So again, eponymous fills a very important and very useful niche in the English language. Interestingly enough, though, you probably use eponyms, that's the noun, remember, uh, you use these all the time already, without knowing it. For starters, there are so many books and movies that are eponyms. See, any work that's named or titled after the main character is an eponym. 
So among movies or TV shows, we're talking Indiana Jones, Harry Potter, Forrest Gump, uh, Mary Poppins, Rocky, Sherlock, Spider-Man, uh, Captain America, basically all the Avengers, and on and on and on. As far as books, I mean, do I even need to list any? Instead, why don't you, the listener, think of like 10 books, preferably novels, and I'd wager like half of them at least will be eponyms. And then there's brands and businesses. Basically, any that are named for their founder or founders are eponyms, or they're eponymous with those founders. Ben and Jerry's, for example, that's an eponym, as it was founded by Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield. There's Coors Brewing Company, started by Adolf Coors in 1873. Uh, there's any number of financial firms, uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Charles Schwab, J.P. Morgan Chase, which is now more commonly known as Chase. Uh, those are all named for their founders. There's Cliff Bars, named for Clifford Erickson, technically the founder's father, but still. And uh, then a similar deal for the burger chain Wendy's, as that was named for one of the founder's kids, who actually was named Melinda, but went by Wendy. So, still good. Now, I wanted to include the company Burt's Bees here, but it actually doesn't count, because although it did have a founder named Burt, technically it would only work if the bees themselves founded or owned the company, which seems unlikely. Okay, so we've already covered books and movies and companies, but we've only scratched the surface of all the types of eponyms out there. There are foods, like sandwiches, which are named for the Earl of Sandwich, who, legend has it, enjoyed the novel snack of cold meat between two slices of bread, which allowed him to keep playing cards for ages without getting up from the table. The fact that he had servants to make him these sandwiches probably helped with that as well, but regardless. There are drink eponyms too, like the Arnold Palmer, a mix of lemonade and iced tea that took the name of the famous golfer who came up with it. There's even facial hair, sideburns, for example, so-called because a Union Army general in the Civil War named Ambrose Burnside sported an especially bushy pair of them. His sideburns, or as they were initially known, Burnsides, extended into a mustache as well, which is technically not required, but as their namesake, General Burnside went above and beyond. In addition to all this, their eponym products, inventions, minerals, medical treatments and diseases, body parts, mathematical theorems, adages, ideologies, places, etc. Oh, and speaking of places, I grew up in a city called Morgan Hill in California, which was founded after a fashion by one Hiram Morgan Hill, who usually just went by his second two names, Morgan Hill. And I've also lived in San Jose, California, and basically any city with San in front of it, or Saint or Santa, those cities are all eponyms, taking the names of various saints. Lastly, here's something fun. You can actually make your own eponyms, new ones, by attaching people's names to the actions, tendencies, or behaviors they're most associated with. Like, for example, if I had a friend named Dwight, and Dwight's thing was high-fiving waiters after they took his order, I could start referring to that move as, like, pulling a Dwight, or Dwighting, something like that. By doing so, I would be making Dwight an eponym, or to put it another way, I would be making Dwight's name eponymous with that practice. I came across a funny, though kind of sad, example of this the other day, involving the former president George H.W. Bush, who one time in 1992 was at a state dinner in Japan when he suddenly became violently ill and threw up on the Japanese prime minister. Based on this incident, a Japanese word, or technically a phrase, was coined, bushusuru, which translated means basically to do a bush or to pull a bush, and referred to the act of throwing up, especially in public. I don't believe this term is still in widespread use in Japan as this took place two and a half decades ago, but it's a great example of how people's names can be turned into eponyms. Now, these can be complimentary, but in many cases, we must acknowledge they're not. Okay, it's now time for the examples of how to use eponymous, or eponym, in ordinary conversation or writing. Example number one. Although many of his friends urged him to reconsider starting his own chain of eponymous all-day diners, aspiring entrepreneur Chris Gusting wouldn't listen. To call it anything else, he said, would be an insult to my sainted grandfather, Mr. Christopher S. Gusting, who sacrificed so much to afford me the opportunities I have today. I will not let him down, and I can, I can just see him someday, you know, like looking down from above and beaming with pride, as another hungry patron eagerly asked to see today's Chris Gusting specials. Example number two. Thank you all for coming to this week's meeting of Eponyms Anonymous, said the man at the front of the room. My name is Charlie Horse, uh, no connection, and as we always do to start off, let's go around the room and say our names and how long our friends and family have been using those names as a stand-in for something we're known for. All right, everyone, that'll do it for the examples, and that'll have to do it for today's show, as I see our producer is presently pulling a Pete, which is to say, tapping his watch frantically, like he always does, to convey the idea that we need to wrap up. We hope you've enjoyed this brief foray into the wonderful world of eponyms and eponymous things, and perhaps now you'll notice a lot more of them, since you know what to look for. This has been another edition of the Word of the Day podcast. My name is Jamie Silva, your host. And for all of us here in the Rav4 Studios, may I say, thanks so much for listening. We hope you have a great, and we'll see you next time.